You ready to turn to the Word together? I've got my big one today. I can't find my little one. So I'm glad I get to be hands-free with the mic because I need both for this one. Let's turn to Colossians chapter 3 together, shall we? Colossians chapter 3. Colossians is a letter written by the Apostle Paul to a group of Christians in a city in the ancient world called Colossae. He had never met them before, but he knew the people that had brought the gospel to them. He had heard about them from some of his co-workers in the gospel, and he just couldn't help himself. He found out they were having some, some issues, but he also just wanted to tell them how happy he was about their faith. Now, this chapter is chock full. We're actually going to read from chapter 3, verse 1, all the way through chapter 4, verse 6. I'm going to give the Apostle Paul a lot of time this morning to communicate to us, and then we're going to back up and look at some of these things a little more closely. Uh, But before we read and and meditate on this together, let's go to the Father. Father, it's been so good just being together to express our love, our adoration, our willingness to obey you, our devotion to love you as you've loved us through Jesus. We thank you for salvation of every kind that comes through him. It began with saving us from our sins, but it hasn't stopped there, not at all. So we pray, Lord, that you will, through this word, uh, continue that salvation from sin's grip on our lives, move us into the salvation of righteousness, living in the kingdom, even now as a people, as a community that would be saved for life, life with you. And I pray this in Jesus' name, amen. Now as I read, uh, you're going to see the word you and, and its forms here. I just want to remind you, in the English, unfortunately, there is no, whoops, there's no clarity when you see the word you, whether it's singular or plural. Like is it you, the individual, or is it y'all? I actually like the y'all thing because it tells you I'm talking to a, a group of you, right, at the same time. Now, as I'm reading through Colossians, I hope that you will mentally insert the y'all, okay? Because he's not writing to individuals. He's writing to a congregation, a community of, of disciples. And that's really important for what we're talking about today, so I don't want you to miss that element of this. Everything he's saying to them He's saying that they are to do this as a community, right? It's too easy for us as individualistic Americans to take everything for me, when in reality, this is for us as a community to do it together. Since then, you, all of you, have been raised with Christ. Set your hearts on things above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things above, not on earthly things. For you died and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. Put to death, therefore, whatever belongs to your earthly nature, sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires, and greed, which is idolatry. Because of these, the wrath of God is coming. You used to walk in these ways in the life you once lived, but now you must rid yourselves of all such things as these, anger, rage, malice, slander, and filthy language from your lips. Do not lie to each other since you've taken off your old self with its practices and have put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge in the image of its creator. Here there is no Gentile or Jew, circumcised or uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave or free, but Christ is all and is in all. Boy, isn't that a statement? Christ is all and is in all. Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved. Did you hear that? Did you hear that three-part description of who we are as a people? Therefore, as God's what? Chosen people. What else are we? Holy. And what else are we? 
dearly loved. Man, if that doesn't give you an idea of what's at stake here, right? Why all these instructions matter? Because that's who we are. And if this is who we are, there's a lot of things in, involved with that. And he gives us some of that. Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Clothe yourselves with that. Bear with each other and forgive one another if any of you has a grievance against someone. Did you notice he's talking about within the community there? He said one another. Not those people out there that are all jerks, you know, because they're not one of us. No. He's saying in your own gathering of disciples, you're going to have grievances, you're going to have hurts, you're going to have uh, betrayals. And how are we supposed to respond to that in our gathering of disciples? What do you say? Bear with each other and forgive one another if any of you has a grievance against someone. That's in the body. Of course, that applies outside the body as well. Over all these virtues, put on what? Do you see it? Anybody? Do you see it? What is it? Put on love. Over all of them. Because you realize everything he just described is describing love. You put on love, and what does love do? It binds them all together in perfect, complete unity. Do you remember that if you love, you have kept the law? If you love, you have fulfilled God's will. If you love. Let the peace of Christ rule in your heart, since as members of one body you were called to peace. That's again, among you. And be thankful. All of you together, be thankful. Let the message of Christ dwell among you richly as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom through psalms and hymns and songs from the Spirit, singing to God with gratitude in your hearts. I'm pretty sure we did that today. Yeah? Got a lot of that done last night too. Whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through Him. Well, you know, he keeps bringing up this thankful thing, right? That's like three times in just a handful of verses. Wives, submit yourselves to your husbands as is fitting in the Lord. Husbands, love your wives and do not be harsh with them. We're taking these to heart, wives and husbands. Children, take this to heart. This is the word of your master to you now. Children, obey your parents in those things that you like and agree with. Is that what the, the apostle said? Children, obey your parents in everything. My kids are looking at me going, oh, you had to rub that in, huh? <laughs> it's not because I'm a daddy. That's not why I said that. The apostle said it, and I'm pretty sure he's not a daddy. Children, obey your parents in everything. Why, though? Because they deserve it? Because they're always right? What do you say? This pleases the Lord. Remember, everything is done in the name of Jesus Christ, giving thanks to God the Father through Him. Fathers, mothers would be included here too now. Parents, we're not off the hook. Fathers, do not embitter your children, or they'll become discouraged. The literal there is passionless. You will squeeze the passion out of them. Slaves, obey your earthly masters in everything, and do it not only when their eye is on you and to curry their favor, but with sincerity of heart and reverence for the Lord. Whatever you do, now employees, this is not an exact comparison because we cannot compare that to slavery, but I think there's a principle here. Listen, whatever you do, work at it with all your heart as working for whom? The Lord, not for human masters, since you know that you will receive an inheritance from the Lord as a reward, it is the Lord Christ you are serving. Even when you're fulfilling obligations to human people that are over you, it is the Lord Christ you are serving. Anyone who does wrong will be repaid for their wrongs, and there is no favoritism. Which is to say, hey slaves, you've got it real bad, your masters might be awful, which a lot of them were. 
A lot of them are great, but a lot of them are awful. And even if you're doing wrong to a bad person, it's still wrong and you'll have to pay for that. So there's no favoritism. There's no letting you off the hook just because the other guy's a jerk, right? That's his point there. Now, masters, again, not exact, but if you're, if you're a supervisor, if you're in charge of people, masters, provide your slaves with what is right and fair because you know that you also have a master in heaven. Now listen, this is again for the whole community. Devote yourselves to what? Now listen, he didn't say make sure you do that once in a while in your services or something. He said devote yourselves. Devote yourselves to prayer. This is, this is an obligation we take seriously. We give ourselves to it. Devote yourselves to prayer, being watchful. Look out for what the Lord is going to do. And be thankful when he does it. Being watchful and thankful. And pray for us too that God may open a door for our message so that we may proclaim the mystery of Christ for which I'm in chains. Pray that I may proclaim it clearly as I should. Now listen. We've been talking about in the gathering and in the household. Now listen to what he does in verses 5 and 6. He says, turning our eyes outward. Be wise in the way you act toward outsiders. Make the most of every opportunity. Let your conversation be always full of grace, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how to answer everyone. Amen. Well, there's so much there. I don't even know why I tried to chew all... The, the, the point is, whether I can talk about it at length or not, just reading it is powerful. Just knowing that that's what our Master is calling us to is powerful. So now, what I have time to touch on, which isn't much... What I want to do is just focus us on a continued focus on the reason we need the church body if we're going to become like Jesus. I began looking at that last time. But I want to remind you that the, Peter, the Apostle Peter wrote in his uh, second letter, he said, for the Father has given us everything we need for life and godliness through his very great and precious promises. Okay? He's given us everything we need. To be, to be a godly people, to become like Jesus. So we really do not have the excuse that uh, we're only human. Well, we, can, we can't become like Jesus. We're just, we're just too messed up. Now, of course, the acknowledgement of the gospel, Jesus and, and the apostles would, of course, acknowledge, yeah. Yeah, we are messed up, and we will mess up. But here's the beauty. Because the kingdom has come, because the power of God is available to us, even that can be overcome in us. The grip of sin that seems so unstoppable in us because we know every day how we're tempted and we give in. What the gospel promises is not just that we can be forgiven of those things, but that by the power of God and the process of discipleship to Jesus, we can be free from its power. We can reliably do what's right. Now, as soon as I talk this way, some people are shutting me off because they're like, look, it sounds like you're saying we can be perfect. Well, not in the technical meaning of perfect most of us have in mind. But you know that word perfect that we read in our Bibles. The, probably the better way to translate that same word is mature or complete. Perfect scares us, so let's not use that word because that makes us think we're never going to take a wrong turn or do a math problem wrong and we're never going to burn our cookies. You know, we think perfect means never making a mistake. That's not really the purpose of using that language in the Scriptures. In the Scriptures, what we're talking about is becoming mature, where you reliably do what's right and wise. You reliably do what's loving. Now, most of us aren't there yet. Maybe none of us. I don't know. But this I do know. That's where we're headed. And we don't have to wait till the sweet by and by to experience it. Because of this process called discipleship. Now, what are the three great gifts that that the Father has given us? There are others, but they're all related to these three. He's given us the Word of Christ, the Spirit of Christ, and what's the third one now? The body. And remember, as powerful as the Word of Christ, which we just read and we will devote ourselves to that, no doubt, uh, the Word of Christ and the Spirit of Christ are so powerful, and they bring the new birth for us. And they carry us through to become like Jesus. But please remember with me, and if you weren't here last week, you know I invite you to listen to this online, but listen, there is such a need for the church family because apart from other disciples in your life, 
you may not understand what to do with the Word, and you may not recognize when the Spirit's at work. Amen? When you're first starting out? And if the Lord Jesus expected that from the moment you came out of the waters of baptism, you had all of the understanding and all of the skills and all of the vision you needed... Why would He put you in a church gathering? Why would He call you from the Scriptures constantly to be together with the disciples? It's because He knew you needed them, right? I wanted to show you a few, and I want to look at the whole thing, but then we'd be here a really long time, and you didn't plan for that. Uh, but start, let's start it, start it at least, even though I don't think we're going to finish. Uh, at the very beginning of chapter 3, and I'm going to just zoom right on backwards, because all I have on slides today are the Scriptures, because I just want to stick there. Boing. Okay. Since then, you have been raised with Christ. Now remember, is that just you individually? Since you as a community have been raised with Christ. Because the reason you're a community is you've all shared in that baptism in Christ together. You've all come to faith in Christ. Not necessarily at the same time, but you share that. All of you have this in common. Since you've all been raised with Christ, what ought we to do together? Set your hearts, in some translations it says, seek the things that are above. Brothers and sisters, one of the reasons you need the church body is that when you first start out as a disciple, and for some period after that, you really don't, you may not have any idea what that even means to set your affections to seek after the things that are above. Because all you've had up till now is things below the earth, the flesh. Right? The visible, the audible, the, the things that you can put in a test tube and, and check out the results. Those things, that's, that's where we live in our earthly selves. So when you enter the waters of baptism, you die to that old self and you rise to live in Christ in the kingdom in a supernatural lifestyle, you may come out and you hear, set your hearts on things above. You're like, I don't even know what that means. What am I setting my heart on? clouds and harps and angel halos? Like, what is that all about? So what do we need? We need people who have been living in that reality to show us what that means. Now, let's give a few examples. What does it mean to set your heart on things above? Well, he gives us a clue when he says where Christ is because he's seated at the right hand of God. Now, I don't know if this means much to you, but the right hand idea is still in force today in our culture, but it's nothing like it used to be. The right hand, because I'm left-handed, so I get this. Believe you me. I know. But uh, the right hand emphasis is not new to our culture. The right hand is the hand of favor, the hand of holiness, the hand of... That's what you do when things are honorable and things are, are, are best. It's right hand. Again, I take no offense, even though I do most of my things left-handed. It's okay. So when it says that Christ is seated at the right hand of God, we have that same language we talk about having a right-hand man. Right? He's my right-hand man. That means that that is the person of my favor and my greatest trust. So when Jesus is called, is said to be at the right hand of the Father, I think that is literally true in space and time. I think he's actually there. But the significance of that is that he rules with God. <laughs> Mama, I mean, he has all authority in heaven and on earth. It's like, hey, Jesus, be in charge of the church. I'll cover everything else. Father said to Son, you've got all, you've got all of it. Every life, every creature, every non-living thing, it's all under your purview. You're in charge of it all, right? Now, if you're thinking to yourself, how do I set my heart on things above? Here's the biggest clue: What does Jesus care about? Because he's the one seated at God's right hand. Amen. And he's in charge of the whole joint. So what does he care about? That's what you as a disciple are going to learn from your church family if we're following the Word and the Spirit. You're going to see us and hear us in what we say and sing and pray and live out conversationally. This is what you're going to see if we're doing our job. The mature among us are going to show you this is how you pursue things that are above. You pursue what matters to Jesus. And how do you figure that out? You go to Jesus. You look at His words. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. You look at what His apostles said. And you start to learn, what is, what is it that's above? It's what is near to the heart of your Master Jesus. Now, in this chapter, guess what Paul does? He gives you a bunch of that. So have you ever wondered, what is that? How do I pursue things above? Keep reading. 
in chapter 3. And you're going to get a whole lot of what he's talking about. And it's not, again, it's not what is located in heaven necessarily. It's what is understood as valuable in the culture of heaven. In fact, I want to give you an example of what I'm talking about. Uh, Look at verse 5 with me. I'm going to zoom ahead. Put to death, therefore, whatever belongs to earthly nature. Earthly, right? Before the things that are above take hold of you. Sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires, and greed, which is idolatry. None of these are strange to probably anybody here. Every single person may not have hang-ups on every single one of these, but can I just say it probably with, with a great deal of confidence? You've had an issue with one of these, haven't you? Or two. Or all. This is where we lived, everybody. And we do not say that, say that to shame each other or to shame ourselves. We've been set free from that shame, but we can acknowledge it, can't we? Because of our confidence of how saved we are in Christ, we can look back and say, oh yeah, that was a mess. Man, that sexual immorality thing, that lust thing, that greed thing had a hold on me. I couldn't, couldn't break free. Paul just brings up what was obvious. This is what used to have a hold of us. Look at verse 6 now. What, what, was, what was our fate because these things had a hold on us? If, if God just let us go as we were, what would have been true? Because of these, the wrath of God is coming. You used to walk in these ways in the life you once lived. I'm so glad you said that in the past tense, aren't you? But now look, this is, this is the punchline. Now that you're disciples of Jesus, now that you are pursuing the things that are above, what does he say? Now you must rid yourselves of all such things as these. Anger, rage, malice, slander, and filthy language from your lips. Anybody still working on some of these? You know, these don't fit in the kingdom. If you want to set your heart and mind and pursue things that are above, you've got to get rid of these. This is not from above. This is the earthly, fleshly stuff. In heaven itself, you don't just get angry at people just because you don't like what they're doing. Now, does God get angry, by the way? Yeah. But you know what's a beautiful statement? He's slow to anger, abounding in love. That's the testimony of the nation of Israel to us. So rage, malice, slander, all of these things, they have no place for us. They, they, they don't fit because we're pursuing things that are above. Check this out. I love this. Don't lie to each other since you have taken off your old self with its practices. He, he refers to this like several times in this passage like clothing. You've taken off that old nasty thing. Anybody ever played sports before? And I know a lot of you have done some like down and dirty work for a living. You put on your clothes or your uniform, you go do what you got to do, and you come back from that activity. Woo, it's rich. Oh, someone like a lot, that's why a lot of people have mud rooms in their house. Like, woo, come on, get that, get that out of here. Don't, don't bring that into the house where we live. The, the stench of it, the, the filth of it. I used to work at UPS, and uh, so I'm walking around, there's dirt and grime everywhere in that place, and I had these work boots on. And I used to live with uh, a cousin of Christina because I was living away from home then. So I would just go there and sleep at night and go work and go to school all day. So I'd come home from my late shift at UPS, and I still feel awful about this. And I walk into this house where these people are generous enough to let me stay and uh, wake up the next morning, and, and what do I see from the door to the room where I'm staying? Ah, oh, nuts. Because three or four times I forgot to take off my boots. And my boots forgot to let go of their dirt until they got on the carpet. And, and I, I remember walking out one day, and uh, her cousin's husband, great guy, he's, he's down there on the thing. And I walk in going, oh, I'm a jerk. Oh, what have I done? And this is the problem. If you don't take off the old self, you're covered in it. It's, it's what people see. It is, it is, it's all over you. So you take that off, he says, and you put on the new self, which is being what? made new again in knowledge and the image image of its creator. This is what I want you to see. Here in the gathering of disciples, here's an example of what it means to take off the old, the earthly, and to put on the new so that you're seeking things that are above. You should be able to see this in your church family. We should be fleshing this out for you or any church family you go visit. If we're doing it right, there should be those who are mature in in the gathering that are helping to live out in front of your face 
these things that are above. Here's an example. Above, where Christ is seated at the right hand of God, this is true. There's no longer any, any focus or attention on who's a Jew or a Gentile, who's circumcised or who's not. Are you barbarian, you, you uncouth, you know, hellion, because you, you don't have all the pr- prim and proper ways of we cultured Greeks and Romans. You eat with your hands and you slop all over yourself and you speak that nasty tongue you speak. Like, the, the prejudice against barbarians back then was intense. We have our own versions of that today. Scythian, by the way, if you're like, what's that about? They're the worst of the barbarians. I remember one person said to me, the Scythians are the ones the barbarians look at and say, now that's a barbarian. I mean, they were the bottom of the totem pole, okay? But in the eyes of of Christ who is above, seated at the right hand of the Father, none of that is the issue. All these labels and titles and all that, they don't enter into into the scene. Whether you're a slave or a free person isn't even important. Which probably doesn't mean much to us, but when you think about who they were and the culture they lived in, where a massive number of Roman people, not citizens, but Roman people who, who were in Rome, a massive number of them were slaves, conquered peoples that were serving other people who bought them as if they were property. You don't think there's this major gap even in the early churches, the way you view people, oh, you're a slave, you have your place over there. Oh, you're a, you're a rich slave owner? Well, please, come on over. Do you remember in the book of James, in one of the churches, maybe more than one, when James was writing to the churches, he said, now listen, don't you show favoritism in your church gatherings. And he paints a scenario as if it was going on. He said, when a poor person walks in in all their shabby clothes and looking all not so great, and you say, uh, hmm, would you just sit on the floor over there, please? And just stay out of the way. But a rich guy comes in in all of his ornamental clothing, and oh, you know, and they walk in, and you're like, oh, oh, hey, get out of here. Right, there's a seat right here for you, sir. Oh, we're so pleased to have you. And, and what James is saying is that is sick. Because James knew what Paul knew. In the kingdom, looking above at what matters to the Lord Jesus at the right hand of the Father, we don't play these games. You know what matters to Christ? You know what he sees? There are primarily two groups of people. And this is not a who, who does he love and who does he not love, but this is, this is how he seems to view everything. There are those who belong to him and those who don't. Amen? Those who trust and follow and those who don't. He loves both groups, but he has to deal with both groups differently. Now here's the question. In the gathering of the disciples, here or anywhere else, what do you see when you see another disciple? We should be showing you what that looks like. We should not be treating men and women differently. Now, we have to be thoughtful there because there are certain things men are called to do and women are called to do in their roles. I'm not talking about that. What I'm saying is you don't treat a woman as less or a man as less because they're a man or a woman. Amen? In Galatians, Paul says there's no male or female in Christ. And that, if you don't think that through carefully, that sounds like a crazy thing to say. But his point is, you're not less of a person because of your gender. You're not less of a person because of the kind of job you have. These are things from above. On the earthly level, of course that matters. You've got strata of every kind in society. That's how the big wigs keep themselves feeling big and keeping the little people feeling little. That's how the earth, the earth operates, not the kingdom. In fact, do you know how much Jesus wanted to put a nail in the coffin of this nonsense? This right here? He brings a little kid, a little child, over to himself. Because all of his disciples are vying for who's going to be the bigwig. And Jesus is so not about being the bigwig, okay? And he's so, oh, come on, guys. He brings a child over. And in the ancient culture, the children are, I mean, I'm glad you're around because we need the human race to keep going. But would you just stay quiet and out of my way? I mean, the children, not much greater on the scale of things as slaves, okay? We've kind of gone way too far the other way, but anyway, it's a different topic. But anyways, he brought a child over, and, and as if to give the most extreme example he could give, he says, now here, this is what I want you to be like. <gasps> a child? What? And what was his point? If there's a child that trusts and obeys, they're great. But they're a child. Uh-huh. If there's a, a woman and they trust and obey, they're great. If it's a man, great. 
If it's a slave, awesome. You see, all of the lines completely vanished except for this one. Who trusts and obeys Jesus? Now, that also goes to how you treat people who don't. In fact, let me zoom to the end here. How should you treat people who are not in Christ? Now, on an earthly level, because in, earth, in earthly terms, how do, how do you treat people who are different than you? Not just religiously. How do you treat them? Hmm? You know, I might acknowledge you, but you're just not on the inside. You're not invited to the stuff that my people are invited to. I don't talk about important things with you because you're not one of my own. Anybody ever experienced that? You haven't been one of someone's own. Or maybe you've treated someone else that way because they weren't one of your own, one of your kind. Now, racially, that's one of the most obvious ones. Just look around the room today. How much ethnic variety do we have in here? Not much, and that's not on purpose. Amen? Okay, we agree. (laughs) That's not on purpose. But in our community, that's primarily true. This is about what our community looks like, with some exceptions. But let me ask you this. If someone, like last night, one of the gentlemen, one of our guests that shared last night was of a different skin color, how should we treat that person who's on the outside of our group? Well, over all these virtues put on what? Love, which binds them all. Now, as far as I know, he's a follower of Jesus, so guess what? He's one of my own. He's one of my own. Hey, I've got brothers and sisters in Christ who have every shade of skin tone all around my, on the, this planet. They speak every conceivable language all around this planet. They eat foods I would never dream of eating all around this planet. They worship the Lord in styles I have never even thought of all around the planet. And do you know something? I have more in common with them than I do with a blood relation who does not follow after Jesus. He's changing the way we view other people. Right? Right? So if you, if you don't do it the way I do it, you're my brother and my sister because we share Christ. But what if they're on the outside? See, in the culture of Christ, even if they don't belong to our group, we have an obligation to people. Look what Paul said again. Be wise in the way you act toward outsiders. Make the most of every opportunity. We should be showing you how to do that as a church. You need the church to show that to you. Now here's one reason why being only together in these special holy services is not the fullness of discipleship that we're looking for. You need to be with a mature disciple interacting with outsiders at the restaurant, at the grocery store, at Lowe's. When the per- you should be at somebody's house when the plumber comes over so you watch that mature disciple interact with the plumber who's not a follower of Jesus. You need to see, not just if all you read in the Bible is be wise about it and you're, you're as a newer disciple going, what does that even mean? Make the most of every opportunity to do what? What are you talking about, Paul? See, the mature disciple has lived in that command, fleshed it out, and learned it from other mature disciples so that they can show you now. I've only started touching on just a few points in Colossians 3, but as a young disciple, if you're trying to tackle obeying Christ just in this one chapter, and you don't have a church family who's showing you how, do you realize how overwhelmed you're going to feel? And you just might give up on the whole idea of becoming like Jesus and say, well, at least I'll make it into the gates. And you'll revert back to that partial gospel instead of living in the fullness of the gospel that the Lord Jesus wants for you. I, I, I so desire, and, and in my mind I envision it, and I pray the Lord bring this about among us, that those who are already living in this way will continue to do so and mature in advance so that they can help lead others. But those who haven't yet caught on to the Lord's vision of this, they haven't been seeking the things that are above in this, in this arena, that you'll begin to realize, I do need to be involved in the lives of other disciples, not just because we, we enjoy each other's company, but because they allow me to learn and train in a way I can't do by myself. So that when we're together, we actually have this understanding together, hey, a mature brother or sister, I'm gonna, I want to be with you so I can learn to be like Jesus. And, I, and, and the mature one says to the, the less mature one, I want to be with you so I can help show you. Let's go. Now you know what's really awesome, and I'll stop here just because time is gone. 
What's really great about pursuing the things that are above rather than earthly things is that even if for some reason the Lord pairs me up with a person that I don't necessarily click well with. You understand what I'm talking about? Like, I'm not talking about not loving people. I'm just saying, if you had to go somewhere with someone, you wouldn't think to call them. You know, you wouldn't think to have them around for the afternoon. And even if for some reason the Lord pairs you up with someone to help disciple them that you're not super excited, because of the things we've been looking at, you're going to do it and love them because they are in Christ. Christ is all and He's in all. And I'm going to see the value of who they are beyond how they chew with their mouth open and I don't like how loud their music is in the car and they keep reusing that same phrase that drives me crazy. Like, right? We look past all of that and we say, hey, you were raised with Christ. Hey, your life is hidden with Christ in God. Hey, you're going to be glorified when Christ returns. Hey, Christ is in you and He's everything to you too. Hey, Christ forgave you just like He forgave me. And the, the connections I have with another disciple, they multiply, they blossom, they bloom. So I want to be with you even though your idiosyncrasies... Mm, that's why Paul said, bear with each other. Didn't he say that? Bear with each other. Now he's assuming... You're going to have to do that on purpose because some people make that hard on you. Okay. Let's learn from each other how to do that. How do I invite you over? Even though I'm not looking forward to this, you know. Because you're worth that. You're that important to me. Because you're that important to Christ. Brothers and sisters, we need the church body to see played out in front of our eyes how to set your heart on things above where Christ is seated at the right hand of the Father, how to set your minds on things above, not on earthly things. For we as a community died, and our lives are hidden with Christ in God. And when Christ appears, who is our life, we also will together appear with Him in glory. May the vision of who we really are in the eyes of the living Christ at the right hand of the Father motivate us to live with each other in this earth the way He calls us to live because we're before anything in our lives, disciples of Jesus Christ. Father God, we come to You now in humility mixed with boldness. Humble because of who we are in ourselves. Bold because of who we are in Christ. And I ask You, Lord, on behalf of this church family, Will you teach us and show us how to live this kind of life as a community? Will you move the mature ones to purposefully love and lead the the less mature? Will you lead the less mature to seek out and desire that help from the more mature ones so that they can become mature and do the same for another along the way? Lord, I pray that this will become the, uh, the culture that permeates all of us as a community that we would honor You. That we would please You. That we would help You change this world through the Gospel. And we pray this all together in the name of Jesus. And if you agree, say, Amen. Amen. Well, just now, can I just briefly ask you, if you're someone who has, who you get the church thing, maybe you even like the church thing, which, as I've been saying, is so important, I just want to make sure you understand that is not the first That's not the first and foremost. The reason the church matters is because of a man named Jesus. And He's the one we desire for you to know more than anyone else. He's the one we desire you to set your heart and affection on. He's the one we want you to trust with your whole life. Because though we will fail you in our process of learning, He will never. Amen? Amen? Now this is the man that God sent into human flesh and blood to be one of us. Because God and humans were in very different compartments and God somehow in His goodness and kindness and wisdom he decided, my son, you're going to enter into their experience where we will experience through you, we will experience their humanity. Now, one of the reasons for that, just one of the reasons, but a really important one, is so that in that human flesh and blood, He would offer Himself on a tree, sort of like that one, almost 2,000 years ago. And in offering Himself on a cross, he, he took upon Himself the wrath of God for all of the sins. All of the sins that we've committed. So that the blood He sheds makes available the forgiveness of everything you've ever done against God. 
Every single one. And I just know somebody, every time I just know it, somebody hears me and thinks to themselves, all except that one, right? I want to remind you, Peter, the apostle who spoke for Jesus, said to a crowd of people, after accusing them of murdering the Messiah, he says, but God will forgive you if you repent and are baptized in the name of Jesus. If you can be forgiven for murdering Messiah, can I just ask you, what is it you think that you've done that is beyond the pale of God's forgiveness? Right? No matter what you think to yourself, he wouldn't forgive that. I'm, I'm here to dash that to pieces with the truth that, yeah, he can handle that one too. Because the life of the God, Son of God is powerful enough. It's powerful enough. Now, you're not just asked to be forgiven and go on your merry way. You're, you're called to submit and bow the knee to a man named Jesus to do as he said and experience the life transformation he, he has to offer. We want to invite you today, if you're ready to finally do that, You've heard the message, you've heard the call, and you've been dancing around it too long. You say, today, I need to just do what the Master said to do. I need to come to Him and obey Him. We want to invite you to come. And if you're ready, we, we will do it today. We'll have you go through the waters of covenant baptism. Join your life to Jesus in a special way.